we have been on this roller coaster. Some in some days things are happening from hour to hour, shifting the balance of forces, shifting the results of what we all want to see, which is a free and fair, transparent uh, calculation and tabulation and recount of the ballot boxes in our country. But let, let's just pause for a minute and look at the positive, and that is that we, the people of Guyana, we, the, the democratically-minded people of Guyana, those who cherish democracy and who have defended democracy, have managed to stop twice, twice so far, attempts to create a coup, to steal the elections, and to install a president who does not have the support of the will of the people, twice. And that is because, although we have a young democracy, that in fact our democracy is stronger than even we may have recognized over the years. And we have particularly to recognize the role of the young people in all of this struggle to stop election thievery, to stop electoral coup taking place in our country. As we all know, and if we recap some of the things that have happened, because I'm sure all of you know this, but sometimes we forget about the, the number of hurdles and obstacles we've overcome to stop what is a coup taking place and, and bringing in an illegal government. The official results of nine of the 10 electoral regions, districts were executed in keeping with the electoral laws, and there's no dispute there. Those results show the PVPC in the lead by approximately 52,000 votes. There was an attempt to rig the election results in Region 4 and vociferous objections were made on March the 4th. Had it not been for these objections, they would, these would have succeeded. This attempt would have succeeded. When the effort to expose the rigging was successful, there were numerous delays, including a bomb threat in the completion of this process became the order of the day. Failing to rig, there was a brazen move to steal the election, and this saw two fraudulent declarations being made for Region 4 by the returning officer, Clement Mingo, on March the 5th and March the 13th. We, the people, led by the People's Progressive Party Civic, and joined with the smaller opposition parties, civil society, local and international observers, prevented an electoral coup from taking place on March the 4th by the RO District 4, this is Mr. Mingo of GCOM, and the Chief Elections Officer, Lowenfield of GCOM, to declare fraudulent results of the election and hence move to swear in Granger as president again. After the March fraudulent declaration, there was a move to the High Court and the Chief Justice. Roxanne George Wilshire vitiated this declaration as illegal. So the declarations made by Mr. Mingo of Region 4 and the declaration made by Chief Elections Officer for all 10 regions were declared as illegal. Mr. Mingo was instructed to comply with Section 84 of the Representation of the People's Act in verifying the votes for Region 4. The move to perpetrate electoral fraud was blocked. In other words, the Chief Justice on March the 10th injunct the Region 4 and the COG come from declaring re results unless a transparent process with statements or polls were used in arriving at the results. That there was an attempt to commit electoral fraud was clear up to this point. To date, there's been no explanation as to why the signature of the PNCR chairperson, Valda Lawrence, was on the March 5th declaration made by Mr. Mingo. The fact is that the other nine declarations for the other nine electoral districts only have the stamp and signature of the returning officer for that electoral district. Mr. Mingo then persisted in actions in refusing to comply with the Chief Justice ruling and the law in his tabulation of Region 4 results. He and other GCOM officials are now before the court for contempt. On March the 13th, a second fraudulent declaration of Region 4 results was made by Mr. Mingo. Alas, the clue plotters defied the CJ, the Chief Justice, and attempted again to achieve their objectives to declare the results of Region 4, and thence have official declarations in which it would have led again to trying to get Granger being sworn in as president. 
Apparently, brick preparations have been made and were made for his swearing in for that day or a day after. The final outcome was again prevented, this time by the statements of the international organizations, the Organization of American States Observer Missions, the joint statements of the US, British, and Canadian missions in Guyana, the US Congressman, the US State Secretary of State, and of course, at the same time, you had the entrance of the chairperson of CARICOM and prime ministers of CARICOM into the Guyana theater of defending our democracy. The PPC and seven other parties requested recounts of the votes in Region 4. Mr. Mingo rejected this request, despite the fact that the law allows for recounts. In fact, on March the 13th, the day before all this happened, the GCOM chairperson, Claudette Singh, had committed to recounting the votes if the parties made a request. She told the media, quote, if there is a discrepancy to be addressed, we will go through to the end. If it cannot be addressed, then we will move to a recount, end quote. Singh also admitted to giving an undertaking to the High Court to facilitate a recount in Region 4. And this was the 15th. She said, as chairperson of the Ghana, I'm quoting, as chairperson of the Ghana Elections Commission, I, on Friday, March 13th, gave an undertaking to Chief Justice Madam Rox and George Wilshire during the contempt hearing that I would facilitate the recounting of the ballots for Region 4. End quote. The first move on March the 4th to declare unverified results for Region 4 prompted the PPPC to release all of its GCOM issued statements of poll and its tally sheets, signed by the presiding officers who worked at polling stations across Region 4. Even the Organization of American States Observer Mission noted that these documents released by the PPC remain unchallenged. A statement from this body, this body's electoral mission, noted, quote, the mission has noted that images of the statements of poll published by the PPP Civic on its website. They produce a result that is vastly different from that being declared by the returning officer and would have a decisive effect on the outcome of the national election. To date, neither the chief elections officer nor APNU has challenged the authenticity of the statements of poll published by the PPPC by producing the copies in their possession, end quote. Following the first move to declare unverified results for Region 4 and the Chief Justice ruling, CARICOM heads led by Prime Minister Mia Motley met with both PPPC leader Mr. Jack Dale and Mr. Granger where commitments were given to ensure that the 2020 election results were finalized in a credible manner. When the March 13th fraudulent declaration results in Region 4 was made and led to more controversy, Mr. Granger invited a high-level CARICOM team in Guyana to oversee a recount of votes in Region 4. This was agreed to by the PPP General Secretary, Barry Jagdeo. Mr. Granger then said he had problems with the results of other regions, despite the fact that the statutory period within recount should be made had long passed, Mr. Jagdeer agreed to a recount of all 10 regions. And this was reflected in the signed agreement between Mr. Granger and Mr. Jagdeer and Prime Minister Mia Motley on behalf of CARICOM. <clears throat> the GCOM chair, Claudette Singh, also gave an undertaking to support the work of the high-level CARICOM team. She said, quote, I welcome this initiative and will assure everyone that GCOM will cooperate fully with the process, end quote. Since then, GCOM's statements of polls seem to have disappeared, since they're not even made available to the high-level CARICOM team in Guyana to supervise the recount, nor did they, abide, did they respond to the request of the EU observer mission a week before that. Efforts continue to frustrate the finalization of results for the 2020 general regional elections and the work of the high-level CARICOM team. One, there was agreement for the Crown to start on Monday, March the 16th, two weeks after GCOM Guyanese went to the polls. On the said Monday, there were several delays. First, with the introduction of a call for a signed agreement by CARICOM, Mr. Granger and Mr. Jagdeo, to proceed the, the recount. 
Valde Lawrence sent in vector control staff at the Arthur Chung Convention Center to fumigate the pre pre premises for ants. This was done in the evening, which could have rendered the location for the recount unusable for a number of, for a period of time. By 6 p.m. on Monday night, stakeholders in the electoral process were removed from the Arthur Chung Conference Center and the lights were turned off. Standing in the massive compound of the Arthur Chung Convention Center, where the containers with ballot box had been brought, police threatened these persons with arrest if they did not leave the premises. Commissioner, GCOM Commissioner for the People's Progressive Party, Robeson Ben was forcibly removed and sustained injuries to his right arm. Working to safeguard the integrity of the ballot boxes, objections finally resulted in one representative per political party being allowed to remain in the compound of the Arthur Jung Convention Center to watchman to monitor the, ballot, the containers holding the ballot boxes. On Tuesday, March 17th, there were further efforts to frustrate the recount with calls to, uh, to have a recount of all 10 regions to start with Region 1. The tacit understanding that the recount would start in Region 4 was clear to all stakeholders, since this was the most contentious area. In all of this, there has been widespread international condemnation from all five international election observer missions, from the Organization of American States, the Commonwealth, the Carter Center, the European Union, and the CARICOM. Mm -hmm. The OAS Electoral Observer Mission on March 13th said the following, quote, the OAS Electoral Observer Mission in Guyana led by former Prime Minister of Jamaica, Bruce Golding is dismayed that in spite of the ruling of the High Court on March 11th, the Guyana Elections Commission was not able to move ahead today, March 12th, with the tabulation of results. For region four. The mission notes that the ruling requires a returning officer, a deputy returning officer for region four to comply with section 84, subclause one of the representation of the People's Act in asserting the election results for the region. This provision stipulates that the returning officer shall, in the presence of persons legally entitled to attend, which includes the duly appointed candidates and counting agents, add up the votes for each party list in accordance with the statements of poll. Aside from the ballots themselves, the statement of poll is the authentic record of the number of votes cast for each party list. The refusal of the returning officer to demonstrate that the numbers being added up are the numbers that appear on the statements of poll lacks transparency and is cause for grave concern. Any declaration issued on this basis is bound to be questioned and the mission would be obliged to so advise the Secretary General. That's the end of the quote from March 13th. Subsequently, the OAS withdrew its uh, observer mission because of what had happened and the, on the second round of trying to do the recount on March 13th. Also statements of representative the diplomatic community, the US, the UK, Canada, and the European Union. Statement of the United Nations Secretary General Statement by statements by the Commonwealth Secretariat um, on behalf of the Secretary General, Dr. Scotland, March 13, 2020. And this is what she says in that one. The Commonwealth Charter to which Guyana ascribes recognizes the inalienable right of individuals to participate in democratic processes, in particular through free and fair elections in shaping the society in which they live. There is still time for the Guyana Elections Commission including the chairperson, the commissioners, the chief elections officer, and the returning officer, Region 4, to ensure democracy is preserved in Guyana. The people of Guyana are fully deserving of this. I have noted the concerns contained in previous statements issued by the Commonwealth Observer Group in Guyana and those issued by other observers and member governments on the ongoing vote tabulation process in Guyana. If the tabulation of Region 4 results is not immediately and satisfactorily addressed in accordance with the ruling of the Acting Chief Justice, this would represent a serial, serious violation of the fundamental political values of the Commonwealth. 
You also had statements from governments of Norway, France, Antigua, and Barbuda. A statement from the UK Foreign Secretary, Dominique Raab. The US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. The bipartisan members of the US Congress. Other congressmen, Ablio Cires, Elliot Engel, Yvette Clark, Francis Rooney, and others in the US government. The United States of America Secretary of State, Mike, Mike Pompeo, in comments about Guyana during a news conference on Tuesday, March the 17th, said, the United States is closely monitoring the tabulation of votes in Guyana. The election took place on March the 2nd. We joined the OAS, Commonwealth, the EU, CARICOM, and other democratic partners in calling for an accurate count. We commend CARICOM's role in seeking a swift democratic resolution. It is important to note that the individuals who seek to benefit from electoral fraud and to form illegitimate governments, regimes, will be subject to a variety of serious consequences from the United States." End quote. In this context, too, we must remember the U.S. representative at the U.N. Universal Periodic Review of Guyana just a few mornings before stated that uh, before the elections, stated that the United States recommends that Guyana immediately implement reforms to strengthen electoral procedures and enhance the independence of electoral authorities to ensure that the March 2nd elections are free, fair, transparent, and credible. The United States is concerned about recent actions by Guyana that may undermine democratic principles, including apparent misapplication of the Guyanese Constitution and certain court rulings. This was no doubt that the gentleman representing the United States at the UN body was referring to the three-month stipulation of having the elections after the no-confidence motion and the appointment of the chair by the president unilaterally. In addition, there have been 80 international organizations, including Nelson Mandela's uh, NGO called the Elders. In Guyana, the Bar Association, the Bishop of the Roman Catholic Church, Muslim and Hindu communities, the Private Sector Commission, the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce, the other commerces from the regions, the Transparency Institute of Guyana, Inc., the FITUG, and dozens of others have come forward. Public statements, for example, by the former Commissioner of Police, Hilal Passad, the former Commissioner Chief of Staff of the Guyana Defense Force, Major General Joe Singh, son-in-law and former minister of the Granger Cabinet, Dominique Gaskin, calling on the President GCOM to comply with the laws and the Chief Justice and hold a recount. And just on the way coming here, you may or may not know that Justice for All, one of the political parties in the coalition, has just made a statement about uh, some time, let me just get the time, about just about 11.30 this morning. And if you'd like, I'd like to read you the statement by the Justice for All, uh, whose uh, leader um, owns the TV's channel I'm on right now. The statement goes as follows. Seven years ago, we, Mr. Sharma, the leader of the JFAP, and myself, Savitri Singh Sharma, the General Secretary, met Mr. Granger, and have since held him in high regards. We believe he was and still is a man of integrity. It is in that basis that we believe he asked the CARICOM chairperson, the Honorable Mia Motley, Prime Minister Barbage, to assemble a team to supervise the recounting of the ballots in accordance with the ruling of the Chief Justice on March the 11th. This, we believe, is a crucial step given all that has happened in the past several days. The Justice for All Party stands for democracy. Mr. Sharma spent most of his life highlighting, life highlighting the voice of the people. We believe in the will of the people, irrespective of which party wins. We believe that recounting, that the recounting process should be permitted and all ballots should be immediately recounted in an expeditious and transparent manner. Any party that wins through a transparent process will have our support. We're uncertain of the party dynamics at this time, but we appeal to Mr. Granger to do the right thing and allow the recounting process to be immediately completed to honor the will of the people of Ghana. This is from the leader of Justice for All Party, Chandra Narain, Sharma General Secretary, and Savitri Singh Sharma. 
Thank you very much, Justice for All. All of the international and regional <coughs> communities have warned that a president of the government sworn in without regard to the laws and constitution of Guyana will not be recognized and will face isolation and sanctions. An injunction to block the recount of votes from the 2020 general regional election was filed by someone called Yulita Moore, who was and is an APNU AFC candidate. The injunction was granted by High Court Judge Franklin Holder. As such, when that took place, Chief Justice Keith Lowenfield, the injunction was granted by the judge, preventing him from embarking upon the recount agreement between President David Grange and opposition leader Barrett Jack Dale. Quote, an interim injunction is hereby granted restraining the Guyana Elections Commission from permitting or authorize any person or persons to any agreement between the President of Guyana and the leader opposition or any agreement between the Guyana Elections Commission and the CARICOM or at all to count or recount any ballots cast by the electors at the March 7, 2020 general region elections until the hearing and review of the judicial application review filed herein. So this is what the court records say. Orders were also granted restraining law and from setting aside or obeying the fraudulent election declaration of Region 4, returning officer Mingo and replacing it with another declaration. And so this is what I've just, the same order applies to the declaration of all the other nine regions. Therefore, the recount that should have been begun at 9.30 on Tuesday, March the 17th, were halted and have been halted until Friday, March the 20th, when the substantive arguments in the case will be held. The filing of an injunction on March the 17th to block the agreed recount exposes, in my view, the duplicity of President David Granger, those around him and those within the APNU AFC coalition. It was Mr. Grange who called the CARICOM chair, Barbados Prime Minister Maya Motley, to say he did not want to be sworn in on the basis of disputed election results and requested a high-level CARICOM team to supervise a recount of the ballots. The People's Progressive Party, although skeptical of his intentions, agreed to this as a political solution to move our country forward and avoid negative consequences for our nation. In addition to the delay in signing the aid memoir, there have been consistent efforts by Granger's agents to undermine the CARICOM agreement, which he himself requested. The latest episode I just described in terms of the court, the approach to the court by an APNU AFC coalition candidate. Should there be a swearing in on the basis of fraud in election results, the People's Progressive Party will treat Mr. Granger's regime as illegal and illegitimate and will pursue the consequences addressed by Secretary Pompeo to the very end, as well as sanctions for members of the PNC APNU AFC coalition, their families, their cronies, and their collaborators. Who, you may ask, are those involved in this electoral coup or electoral thievery by their actions, both covert and open and intentional? Who are those involved? The actors in this electoral coup are many, as it took an entire machinery of people to attempt to subvert the electoral machinery and procedures, including tampering with and producing fake SOPs. This was not done in a back room with one or two people. This is an entire machinery of many people at many layers who knew what was going on and were involved. There are many who comprise the leadership of the rigging cabal. The top leadership of the PNC, APNU, AFC are involved. The GCOM CEO, Chief Elections Officer, the Deputy Chief Elections Officer, the Returning Officer for Region 4, the Returning and many other staff in the GCOM apparatus. The President appointed GCOM commissioners as well as many who are complicit in carrying out unlawful instructions in order to subvert the electoral process and prevent observers, local and foreign political party representatives who are lawfully entitled to be there and the media from being allowed to monitor the process. A friend of mine wrote in the newspapers today, and I support his thoughts, 
The buck stops at Mr. Granger. He has played this game that he is decent, honest, and a man of integrity. Far from it. He is the leader of the pack. The rigging cabal takes orders from him. Mr. Granger cannot make agreements like he did with Barajag Deo and Caracom for a reaccount, and then allow his people to go to court to stop the recount. Sanctions must not escape him. If he's not a victim, if he is a victim of a criminal gang that exists in his APNU AFC circus, then he must seek to speak out. Otherwise, he's as guilty as they are. Then there's this, and I'm still quoting from my friend in the newspapers today. Then there's a special case of Justice Claudette Singh. She has watched a GCOM became the arm of the rigging cabal. She has allowed the rigging cabal to carry out their plan unimpeded. Justice Singh even promised the Chief Justice that she would ensure a recount of the region for votes. She promised in court, and she did in front of cameras. When the CARICOM brokered agreement facilitated a recount, she said she is fully supportive. Like David Granger, she says one thing and does another. Like Granger, she hides behind all sorts of things. Justice Singh has clearly accommodated the rigging cabal. To the extent that I'm forced to ask before and I'm asking again, is Justice Singh also an integral part of the, of the rigging cabal? CARICOM, the Commonwealth, the OES, the Carter Center, local and international observers, the private sector, the media in general have all concluded that results for Region 4 are not credible. The Barbadian Prime Minister has made it clear that there are forces that do not want to see the votes recounted. Now there are independent voices, like Granger's son-in-law, Dominique Gaskin, the former head of the army and former chair of GCOM, Joe Singh, the former head of the police force, Mr. Sulal Passat, the Roman Catholic bishops and others who've spoken out. More people will, will and must break the silence. Sanctions, both locally and in, internally, must be severe so that no one in the future will contemplate this road. These sanctions must be now. It is about Guyana and Guyana's chance of rapid development. Depends on how fast we act. Any dithering will end up with Guyana going backwards with decades to recover. It is unfair. It is criminal. Locally, the media with independent voices must make these people feel uncomfortable. The private sector can act in many ways to implement their own kinds of sanctions. International governments and bodies have powerful sanction measures. The time to impose them is now, end quote. My dear friends, we stand at a critical junction. It is sanctions or we return to count, recount the ballots in the ballot boxes as agreed to on March the 15th with Granger, Jagdeo, and Maya Motley, and in keeping with the electoral laws of our country. We have our crossroads. Sanctions or recount? One of the two. Electoral fraud will not be accepted by the Guyanese people. We've had enough. Enough is enough. This power that the Granger-led cabal in government is wielding has led people to ask me, are the ministers still ministers? And my answer is, no, 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 and no again. In accordance with the Constitution, Article 104, which allows for ministers who are appointed as members of parliament in Guyana after the dissolution of parliament to continue as ministers until election day, the day on which the elections takes place. So in other words, ministers were allowed, although parliament was dissolved, to remain as ministers because by the parliament being dissolved, nobody was a member of parliament anymore. And in our constitution, in order to be a minister, you must also be a member of parliament. So the constitution is very clear to provide a mechanism that in the period of dissolution, that between the period of dissolution when it starts to election day, that the ministers continue in office. However, that ends when election day is over. And so I am categorical that after the elections and pending the declaration of else, that is from March 2nd to now, there are no ministers. The government is run by the president and the public service until the new president is sworn in. The present persons masquerading or claiming to be ministers, including the prime minister and vice presidents, are no longer. All persons 
who were ministers up to March 2nd are required after March 2nd to vacate their offices with no access to state resources, cars, bodyguards, household security, etc. I know this. I was, I've been a minister. I know what happens on election day. When election day is over, you vacate your office as a minister. You vacate your privileges. And so you wait for the results. And so, by the way, in March, when we go back to the 2015 election, when we go back to the 2015 election, from May the 11th, when the elections took place, to May, May the 15th, Ministers were not using, were not able to use state resources because we're no longer ministers. And so, after the election day, one's ministerial status evaporates, it's gone. The cloak of ministerial status is no longer there. You have to wait for the results and maybe hope that you'll, your party will win and hope that you will be appointed a minister again. So this use of all these state resources and driving on in SUVs with food, full security, etc., is not acceptable. The Constitution does not allow that. Only the president, which is very clear, remains in office until the new president is sworn in. So the president, as a head of state, is protected in our Constitution. The public service permanent secretaries remain. The technical staff remain. The public service remains. It is the ministers who are, are not uh, cloaked with any authority. So this brings me to the public health ordinance signed by President Granger with regard to the coronavirus. Firstly, he has, has handed enormous powers to the Minister of Public Health, who in fact, as I've just said, is no more. He does the same with the Minister of Education, Citizen and Public Security, who themselves are no more. Some may ask, well, how will one fight the coronavirus without ministers? There are permanent secretaries, public servants, professional and technical people who are trained as public health specialists, both within the public service and outside the public service, who are competent and capable if given the right authority and not a minister interfering, would be able, they know what to do and how to handle epidemics. This is not the first time we had a cholera epidemic in 1993 that swept the entire South America and Central America. And we were able to successfully overcome that and contain it from coming into the more populated areas. We have faced the pandemic of H, uh, H1N1 and SARS. There are people within the health sector of Ghana, both public and private, who know what to do. However, let's go to the order which was signed by Mr. Granger. So this is his signature. This is not somebody else's signature. It's not someone acting for him. It is his signature. In my opinion, as a former Minister of Health, the order surpasses what is required by law with regards to how you address a pandemic or an epidemic. And in part, my knowledge of the last 30 odd years that there's been no such order of this nature ever in, in Guyana. No such order signed by President regards to a public health ordinance. In fact, when one reads it, one has to wonder, is this a state of emergency being declared, disguised under the auspices of the coronavirus? No other country has gone to such lengths as far as I'm aware. And let me just give you some ideas. The first part of the order concentrates on a number of the constitutional issues. But what is interesting, which is not a constitutional issue, is that there's a, a, a line and it says, whereas, after it's number one, two, three, four, five, six, six, whereas, COVID-19, constitutional emergency that threatens national security, which requires a national response. This is an odd comment coming in a public health ordinance. One could say it's, a, it's an emergency that threatens the welfare, the well-being, survival of our people. And on humanitarian grounds, you have to do the following. It doesn't say that. It talks about constitutional emergency that threatens national security, which requires a national response. So in other words, this COVID virus 
is a national security issue and not a public health emergency, not a, a threat to our economy, not a threat to the lives and well-being of our people, and particularly those who are at risk, but it's a national security issue. And that's the one thing that flawed hit me in the face when I read it. Then you have the measures of which, the, as I said earlier, the president con conveys an enormous amount of responsibility and, 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 and power to the Minister of Public Health. In the cholera epidemic, there was no such public health ordinance issued by the president of the day, Dr. Jenny Jagan, and that as Minister of Health, we worked with various stakeholders, both private and public, to be able to manage the spread of cholera in Guyana. And we had much more limited resources than in 1992 than we have now. The minister shall take measures to restrain, segregate, and isolate persons suffering from the disease or who may be likely from exposure to the infection suffer from the disease. So again, restrain, segregate, and isolate. Then it goes on in a number of ways, which some of which you may have seen and seen in the papers. Remove to the hospital and provide curative treatment of persons suffering from the disease. These are cut and paste from the public health orders, which is over 100 years old. But what is required is that the minister is supposed to identify where are the centers where people can go if they are uh, infected and they do need medical help, particularly those who are reaching serious, serious conditions where they need oxygen, they need invasive treatment, etc. This talks about a hospital. The next part talks about that the Minister of Health, of course, be provided in any part of Guyana as he or she may deem it, one or more hospital or camps for the reception, isolation, and treatment of persons suffering from COVID-19. She is supposed to name where these places are. Where do you go? In fact, someone said they had called the, the hotline and was told by the person, oh, you have a cold, um, go to your clinic. And so I don't know, I haven't tested the hotline myself. Of course, the minister has also other powers of public health to call on the police force and other law, and other law enforcement agencies to provide assistance with the enforcement of the provisions of the paragraph where necessary. And this has to do with restraint, segregate, and isolate, etc. Then, of course, you have the very strange ones of remove, disinfect, and destroy the personal effects, goods, buildings, and other article, material, or thing exposed to infection from the disease. This is the most bizarre of them all, and this has to come to do with a cut and paste from the Public Health Act instead of following what are the WHO guidelines in all of this, which are very clear. And so you don't need to burn these because there's a limited period from which these the virus will stay on the surfaces of these. And so, of course, and then it says, goes on next one, one of the other ones, diagnose, prevent, or check the disease, including the prohibition or restriction of movement of persons and public and private conveyances of any kind whatsoever within and to and from an infected area, and take any other measures considered necessary. Of course, there are other things given out to the Minister of Public Security, the Minister of Citizenship, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Finance, as you've heard, has been given a, a blank check, which he's now asking for five million US uh, to get from overseas banking company, banking agencies. But the odd ones come along again in the order. All citizens, residents, tourists, and members of the private sector are urged to act in accordance with the law and comply with any lawful directives and advisories issued by appropriate government agencies to prevent further transmission, etc. Why are the members of the private sector identified. That's a very odd one. You're talking about all citizens, residents, tourists. Why members of the private sector? That's an odd one, too, that threw out in my face. And then the last one, of course. This direction shall remain in force and effect until withdrawn by the president. In other words, there's no date. In most countries, they're saying in some cases two weeks in, in where they're having restrictions or self-isolation. In some cases, the countries are doing it, or even states, the United States are doing it for two weeks, some are for a month, but very rarely indefinitely until withdrawn by the president. So this is, again, this is the government, I believe, using the coronavirus as a means to suppress our people's rights. And, and in effect, as I said, have a state of emergency 
in effect without actually calling a state of emergency. My last program on January the 30th, since my last program on January 30th, I stated that the Ministry of Public Health the day before had stated that the ministry is prepared to handle the coronavirus. And I said in that program, I don't want to scare anyone as coronavirus is very serious, but this ministry cannot even manage the high number of cases of germ with flu and respiratory infections across Guyana, which was taking place at that time, particularly in the interior. Basic things like face masks are absent from the premier hospital, the Georgetown Public Hospital, an item that would be essential in case of an outbreak of that virus here, or in terms of preventing the virus. And so, yesterday, that's what I said then, and I called on people to follow the international uh, guidelines of keeping throat moist, wash hands, clean and disinfect surfaces constantly as virus could stay on the surface for quite a period of time. Now yesterday, Mrs. Lawrence, I will not call her minister because she's not a minister anymore, said they are waiting test kits to come, come into the country. Can you imagine? Two months after WHO declared this is a global pandemic and called on countries to make preparations, the Ministry of Health of Guyana, Public Health, has a few kits only donated by Pan American Health Organization. And they're now waiting for the kids to come in at a time when you have airlines not operating and even cargo ships and so on are restrained in many countries from traveling. Seamen are not working, etc. Our, our airport is closed. So maybe they will fly it in under some special aircraft. But this is two months after, two months after WHO gave the, the warning that something had to be done. This, and they're now waiting for testing kids to come in. She doesn't even say to the public how many testing kits are coming in. The Ministry of Public Health, under the leadership of Mrs. Valder Lawrence, the Granger government, have failed the people of Ghana once again. Once again. It is time that the public health persons in the Ministry of Health take control and manage the situation properly and order what is the correct medications and drugs and protective gear for the staff in the health facilities, and that if there are ICU and other facilities that have to be set up to take care of cases, that those places be known to the public and that proper hotline that is functioning to guide people what to do. In previous programs, I've called this fight that we're having from the no confidence motion to now, 14 months and three weeks, I have called this Operation Rescue Guyana, the whole struggle for free and fair elections, to rescue our nation from the incompetent, corrupt, Granger-led PNC APNU AFC coalition. Rescue our nation from the downward trajectory they have put our nation on and put Guyana back on the path to, de to prosperity. And now, of course, what we have, the foundation we have to be put on, firmly back on, is democracy. We can't have prosperity without democracy. We can't have development without democracy. We believe, however, that we're stronger together for, for, for our country. That this whole period, this whole period has taught us lessons as a people. We are still on the path to rescue our nation from an electoral coup and defend our democracy. We haven't come off that path. We still have to stay on that path. We have to keep vigilant and be on that path. This time is unlike the 1970s and 80s. Guyanese are not alone. We have a strong pro-democratic movement led by the PVPC and joined by other political opposition parties, civil society. And we're not alone regionally and internationally as we were in the 1970s and 80s. Never has this happened before, the scale mm -hmm. of attention and support and defense of democracy for Guyana outside of Guyana by external agencies. We thank all of our people and friends of Guyana and what has been proven in this last 17 days is that our young democracy, our young democracy has been able to stand up to extreme pressure so far and extreme 
efforts to undermine it. And it has been able to stand wobbly, shaky, yes, but still to be relatively intact. And so we have to make sure that we continue to stand and defend the democracy of Guyana. We may have, this is a battle where we're on the side of righteousness. The side of democracy and human rights is always the side of righteousness. It doesn't matter what political party, what ethnicity, what gender, what part of Guyana we live in, it doesn't matter. It is democracy is a foundation which we all need like oxygen to be able to function as a nation. And so we have to may we may have to go through some more hurdles before we're able to succeed in having the recount of the ballot papers in the ballot boxes. But we shall succeed and we shall have a government that is based on transparent and credible measures and on democratic principles. Every time they tend to block us and to move in an undemocratic, dictatorial manner, we've been able to block them. And we continue to be vigilant and to make sure that they don't succeed. We want to thank all our friends, all our supporters, all our members, mm -hmm. many of those who were silent before, who have recognized that this is not about partisanship, it's not about which party you voted for. It's about standing up for the right, for justice, for democracy. And we thank those persons for coming forward. Because if men and women continue to be silent and had continued to be silent, the coup attempt of March the uh, 4th and March the 13th would have succeeded. And so we're we are grateful for the courage and strength of all our comrades and people and friends who stood up for democracy in our country. And I want to particularly single out young people because young people have been the, some of the most active, outspoken, and courageous in terms of this whole struggle to prevent a coup from succeeding and derailing our democracy. All Guyanese, Supporters, particularly supporters of the PVP, are urged to remain vigilant and calm. Do not be provoked and ensure that no action is taken in contradiction with the laws of Guyana. Stay home and await further guidance from the party. There will be a time for visible expression of disgust with and rejection of the APNU AFC coalition's hijacking of our democracy. The PVP in government shall have to start all over again, as in 1992, to reconstruct, to put this economy back on a firm and stable footing and restore the programs which help the poor and vulnerable and those at risk, and restore the independence of the judiciary and legislature from executive interference and protect the rule of law and democracy. Let me take the first call coming in. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Hi, good afternoon, Madam Gail. Yes, good as afternoon. You know, as a Guyanese, a peaceful Guyanese citizen, I don't have words to describe what has come down on this nation yeah. for the past 17 days. Today is the 19th day of March that yes. we had an election on the 2nd of March. Yes. I just want to steer a start for the young people who voted for the first time. I don't, cannot believe what you're going through. Yeah. Everyone who had a hope that you could have a different Guyana from what we had to pass through and endure for the past four and a half years, I really don't have words. I just want to commend the last set of people who came out in support of this recounting, Mr. C.N. Sharma and Ms. Savitri. I think it was commendable, and I would like to call them, and many other right-thinking Guyanese whether whosoever you support it, to come out and speak now, because now is the time. It's not too late. I think we could still get over this, but now is the time. Everyone needs have to play a part. Let me do it peacefully, and let me fight for democracy back in our country. Because we already see, it's so frightening to see 
the amount of lines if you go for a little food item. Yeah. And we start to see that already and the sanctions even come. So we need to educate um, another section of this Guyanese public on what sanctions look like. Mm. Because they just see it as a war, they don't understand it. And who knows it, feels it, knows it. Yeah. So we really be in a terrible state in this country. Plus we have to deal with coronavirus. So we're really in a bad shape. I, I'm last for word, man. I'm such a vibrant PVP supporter, but for the past 17 days, I don't know. I don't know where and what future hold me and my family and the entire Guyanese. We just hope common sense can prevail. We could do the right thing, and we can get by this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you guys really did a good work so far. I don't know where we would have been without some of these people. And, and like you said, the young people, they really stand up, and I'm very proud of them. I'm proud to be a Guyanese. Never mind, my head is very low right now, <laughs> but uh, we're going to bounce back. Yep. We're going to bounce back in flying colors, and we're going to fly to great heights. We're just going to get through this, keep it up, and to all my fellow um, right-thinking Guyanese, no matter who you support it, we're going to get through this, and we're going to be a nation to talk about. People are going to gonna fight to come to Guyana. I'm, I'm very sure of that. We just need time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very well said. And the young man reflects, I think, uh, uh, the kind of uh, emotional roller coaster people have been on. But he's very confident. And yes, we are going to have probably more hurdles, who knows? Um, but we're ready for that. And we're not going to give up. Uh, we're very clear sighted on the end game and what we're going to be able to achieve. And so don't get down. We will. As I said, you know, like being on a roller coaster like this, or, and, and that's how it's been like. But we're going to succeed in the end. We just have some of the hurdles we're not aware of what more could be put in our path. But we're ready for them. We're vigilant. We're on the ball. We're monitoring everything. And so uh, we will succeed in the end for the betterment of our country. The young man asked about sanctions, and I didn't deal with that. And he's right to ask about that. I mentioned it based on the statements made by various governments and organizations. Sanctions can take a number of forms. And I remember someone saying yesterday to me, um, who cares about sanctions? Bring on the sanctions. We don't care. This was said by an APNU person that felt uh, rangers should be sworn in right away and, and to hell with sanctions. Well, let me just explain. Sanctions uh, can be pretty um, serious and are serious for the general public. And so whilst it, it, it targets an, a country based on the behavior and action of undemocratic action of its leaders or leaders at various levels, or including the army, if the army has stepped in in some countries, that generally the entire population suffers. And, and I'll give you a couple of examples of those. The, one of the early steps with sanctions um, that is generally taken is to, one, um, remove visas remove the visas of those persons traveling to their countries, them and their families who are thought to be involved in, in this case, electoral fraud or, or things like that. And so that immediately puts a major block for some of those persons because they're targeted. Um, and they know they're targeted by those governments because their visas have been withdrawn. The second issue is that Ghana's uh, credibility at an international level begins to come under question. So that, for example, Ghana sits in the Organization of American States, um, the Commonwealth, for example, CARICOM. Um, the example of the Commonwealth is where Zimbabwe was removed as a, a suspended as a member of Commonwealth because of rigged elections, because of human rights violations. You have also other countries that are under suspension. Uh, globally, for example, you have those that are under international sanction and others who are under country-to-country -country sanctions. So Iran, for example, and a number of European countries have sanctions against Iran. And so the importation of food, basic supplies, particularly medicines, are hampered and hindered based on sanctions that the trade uh, cannot go on. And countries are told not, and companies are told not to trade with that country how they can face repercussions themselves. And so there's an issue of impact on trade, both import and export, and of course on the availability of essential items which we may or may not produce. 
as well as being able to make money because it affects your, your exports. It also affects your uh, investor climate as that many companies who may want to come and invest are now hesitant because of course companies need to have insurances and uh, deal with banks and if they're dealing with a country that's considered a rural country they would not be able to get coverage for insurance and uh, any uh, financial transactions. It also would probably affect those who are investors in Guyana who now are put at risk in terms of their financial viability, particularly again their insurances and stuff like that that they require to, to manage as large companies. The totality of the impact is that people do suffer and the poor in particular, poor and vulnerable are the ones in all these countries where this has happened, suffer the most. It is really meant to be, it's an attempt to make countries comply with what is international law, what is internationally recognized, and um, we have seen the impact, for example, on Venezuela, our neighbor, with sanctions against Venezuela and the impact it's had on the Venezuelan people and the difficulties they've faced uh, to, to manage their lives. And that is why so many of them have left Venezuela and gone to the various parts of South America, including Ghana, looking for refuge. So we have an idea. This is not an academic exercise. There are enough cases in the world where this has happened in the past and what is probably happening presently to countries that are under sanctions. And so we, we call for sanctions, yes, but we also call for the GCOM and the president to count the ballots in the ballot boxes and let us complete this process and swear in the entitled government, the entitled president of our country, Irvan Ali. There is no dispute amongst any of the political parties other than APNO, AFC, PNC, nor any of the observers, nor any of the international community who won these elections. And so we need to go through the process and complete it. Thank you. Let me take one more call. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Hello? Sorry about that. I meant I pressed the wrong button. Sorry. I didn't mean to do that to the caller who was on just now. I'll try one more call if we can come through quickly enough. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to Miles Hi. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Gate Shira. Yes, good afternoon. Here now. I was thinking, right, these things are going on. What happened the minister I mean, thinking what happened to the old people then? When do food prices are going up? You go into the supermarket, you can't get what you want. The market also closing. Certain stores. What happened to these people them? The minister ain't getting a fat salary. The poor people them ain't getting nothing. Right? People yeah. they got nothing. The people who got children and who got to work to maintain their children. What become of these single parents in this crisis now? Exactly. Right? Exactly. You see, people not think, this minister and not think, they claim the win, put out the um, statement of all. This is how people put out the all. We run it on the internet, we see it. Come out and say something. Exactly. It's not that, it's like, no, nothing can come, nothing can go, the poor people be the suffer. Yep. All the time, for four years and a half, the poor people are suffering. Tax, more tax, everything is tax, tax, tax. All the time, these yeah. people then need to do something. They need to come out and say something. Yeah, well, you're they... getting a full day of work. A one, they don't work sometimes whole week. Look at the Chinese store them out and close up. Yeah. What happened to these people who work with these exactly. Chinese? Exactly. Exactly. They can't feed their family now. No, well, I mean, the government clearly, uh, and Mr. Granger, because we're, in my view, there are no ministers left anymore. But the president must bear the responsibility that for the last, uh, since this, the 2nd of March, this country's on hold, forget, put aside coronavirus. Exactly. People haven't been working, their markets are not functioning, they, people are been at home, they don't know what to do, many places are closed all the time. And of course you're correct, ma'am, that the, the poor, the poorest amongst us and the, and the vulnerable are the ones who suffer the most. 
And in this that period of... That's what I was saying up to last. Uh, these people uh, need to come forward. Come this, file, this vote and let it finish and let people go back to their life. Exactly, exactly. After they didn't even have greens on the market properly. Yeah. People coming from all the way, quarantine, all over. People coming, they need to do something and see yeah. what's going on. But them, just in case, because they get in the fat money, they live on that. They make business for poor people, they business for themselves. Yeah, exactly. I mean, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad you raised that because people sometimes focus only on the top and they forget about how these these actions or reactions have an impact on, on ordinary people, uh, working class people in our society, regardless of what political party. This, what is going on in our country is impacting on APNU supporters, PVP supporters, those who support the small parties, those who didn't vote at all, is impacting every single person in our country. And Mr. Granger has to bear the brunt of this responsibility. He can't hide behind some forces that he claims that uh, are not in control. He is in control, and he can make it clear and give orders to the three commissioners or replace the three commissioners. If the three commissioners are rebelling against him and mutinying against the president, then he can replace all three of them. It's he appoints them. So they're not by any consultative process like the chairperson. If they're rebelling against him and, and they want to create a mutiny in GCOM, replace them. Mr. Granger still is the president of Guyana. He's the head of state. The Constitution has given him powers. I hope he used the powers to defend the democracy and protect democracy and not use it to usurp democracy as he did in the last five years. So take care of yourselves. Have a blessed weekend. Stay positive. Stay positive. We have many roads to go, but we will be successful. You are sure of that. Take care of yourselves. Don't drink and drive. Be careful. Bye-bye.